Hi everyone, this is K.E. Seto Kaiba, and today I'm really excited because we have a very big topic, and so I want to get into it as soon as possible. Um, but this topic is something that I thought of years ago when I was first starting chess, and it's a small thing, um, but it, you know, it might have larger implications further down the road. So without the mystery, let me start explaining what this small thing is. The small thing is, what do the names of openings actually mean? You know, there's a lot of terms like gambit, there's a lot of terms like defense, a lot of terms like formation. You know, what do these actually mean? And to me, that was kind of a mystery for a while. And of course, the ECO code tries to organize all of the chess openings and variations. And there's literally over a thousand of them. So there's a lot to sort through. And so people have tried to catalog those. And other people have tried to organize chess openings by pawn formation. That way you can teach certain formations and the similarities and things like that. But not too many people will talk about what exactly makes the actual name of the opening. You know, how do you define one name versus another name? And I've noticed that there's a lot of patterns. And so this entire video will just be a bunch of openings with examples. And I'm going to try and categorize into as many um, openings as possible into very small categories that we can kind of use to help sort and help identify what makes an opening a certain type. So this will be a lot easier once we start explaining than I think once we get kind of on pace, we'll kind of see what I'm talking about. So let's start getting into it. So the first example I would like to mention here is we'll have a normal Rui Lopez thing. And the first term is opening. Um, it literally is in the name, Rui Lopez opening. As with all of these, the, all of these terms we're trying to find, they'll literally be in the name of what we're trying to look at. So opening, as in the Rui Lopez opening, is a general term for some chess mainline. It is usually something which has been played a lot, it's been analyzed often, and typically there's a lot of quote-unquote theory for the player to learn. And so that's a very general, you know, what is an opening? That's what makes the chess opening an opening. Now, if we were to go further into this grand opening, you know, overarching Rui Lopez opening, if we were to play a few further moves, all book moves, say so we'll play something like this. So a position like this would be a very particular what's called variation or line. And both of these, you know, variation or line, variation is more common. So all that means is this is like a smaller particular branch, which is inside a larger opening. Now this exact position is still, quote unquote, the Rui Lopez opening because that was what the game started with. However, this exact position here is a very specific variation. Um, this is opening positions called a ermit variation. And this phrase um, variation comes you know, from the subset within the larger opening that we call opening, Rui Lopez opening. And so if we keep going further, well, then we can actually get into a very famous position called the Berlin Wall or Berlin Endgame. And this position here it's almost like an endgame because we've traded queens off and there's so many pieces on the board. It's crazy that we can call something an opening and an endgame and we're already on move 8. Only 8. How can you call an endgame on move 8? Um, but this has been studied so deeply that you know it can get to that. Now, the purpose of this video is more to focus on the names. We're not going to get too much into opening theory and teach deep preparation here. So we're just trying to get to the terms and so far we've defined opening and we've defined ter the term line and variation. So next, we have the next one here. Sometimes an opening will have the name game in it. And so you might recognize, say, for example, this opening here, where instead of pushing the, putting the bishop on b5, we'll put it on c4. This is called the Italian game. So whenever there's the term game within an opening name, game typically refers to some of the oldest openings that were studied in chess. Now, the Italian game here, this position has been recorded in the early 1500s by some players like Polario, and it was even analyzed by players like Greco in the early 1600s. And we're talking about year, you know, so chess is a really old game. So there's other examples, you know, the Italian game isn't the only one. Another really old opening is if we were to go knight c3 instead of bishop c4, and then we get knight f6. This position is the start of what's called the four knights game. And again, game denotes that this is one of the earliest openings studied. Now, the very first opening we looked at, the Rui Lopez opening, is actually one of the oldest openings that was studied in chess. Um, but for whatever reason, the name over time, people have changed it to the Rui Lopez opening, but it used to be called the Rui Lopez game originally. 
And my theory on this is a lot of people not really knowing there's a difference. They just kind of use these terms interchangeably. And maybe people just started calling it Rui Lopez opening because it sounded better or for whatever reason. And it just kind of caught on, I guess, better than the original name, which is Rui Lopez game. So, you know, maybe a video like this and it'll help standardize so people will be at least more aware of what the right terms are. So maybe they can address chess openings by the correct names in the future. So that was game. So now what's a gambit? And so let's show a different example here. So now we have what, what is known as the king's gambit. And so any gambit here it describes an, any opening where one side sacrifices something, usually material, usually up one or two pawns, sometimes even more, for some type of compensation. Now, the compensation might not always objective, you know, objectively justify the sacrifice, and that's where you get the term sound. So if a gambit is considered sound, then it is generally considered solid. But there's lots of analysis and debate and a lot of you know, controversy between what, opening, what openings are actually sound gambits and which ones are unsound gambits. And so here, you know, once we have a gambit, you know, there's a pawn that's being offered. So if, in whatever opening, if the other person accepts the pawn, or whatever is sacrificed, it is said to be accepted. And so if they play here, this would be the king's gambit accepted, because they took the material. If they play any other move that does not take the material, then this would be declined. So in a position like this, this would be some variation, the king's gambit declined. Now, this brings us to the other, the third option, which would be like d5, and so this is called a counter gambit. So this is not yet accepting the original sacrifice, and you're actually making a sacrifice of your own, literally a counter sacrifice, hence counter gambit. In this case, now white can actually take the e5 pawn for free, you know, and it looks for free, and that's kind of the thing. Um, this is just a small little detail, we're not going to get into theory, but they can't actually take this because then there's this very annoying queen check, and very tricky theory where black is already much better. But again, the purpose of this is just to show openings and give a good sense of, you know, where these terms come from. So that was counter gambit. So now, after this counter gambit, let's take a look at system. And so I'm sure most people are going to know the very famous one. We're going to look at probably one of the most popular systems out there first. So this position here is called the London system. And again, system is in the name, so there's something that's more special about this. And so what's special about systems is any chess system refers to some chess opening where the focus is really just on one side, and this side can pretty much play this system against anything the opponent does. So in the London system, white always has a pawn in d4, they always have a knight on f3, and they always have a bishop on f4. So this configuration is what denotes this as the London system. Now, other moves can be played, and sometimes these moves are, you know, usually played within the first three moves. They don't have to be. But there's a lot of patterns that come up from this opening. And so, for example, in the London system here, even though these three are the only things that actually have to be in this configuration, usually white will place their pawns on c3 and e3. Usually the b1 knight will go to d2. Some, you know, Often the f1 bishop will go to d3. And white usually will castle kingside Sometimes they'll play the pawn from h2 to h3, and the purpose of that is to create a look for this bishop, so that way if it's attacked by, say, something like knight h5, then this bishop has a retreat square, bishop to h2. And so this might sound like a lot, and quite frankly it is, but with systems, that's the whole concept, where you're playing something that's very um, repetitive, I guess is a good word for it, where you can play this really against anything. And it might sound boring to some people, but systems are really good for beginners because of the fact that you can really play them against pretty much anything. So you have a lot less things to study. Once you learn those patterns, the arrows that I just had up there, then you know pretty much the main moves to look for in the London system or whatever system you're trying to study. Now, the negative to doing this is that if you play systems, it rarely puts pressure on the opponent. And so what I mean by that is if you play this setup, then black can pretty much choose their own setup against white system. And that's true for all systems, is that you're giving your opponent a lot more freedom than some of the other chess mainlines, which might be a lot more forcing. Now, because the London system is such a common, very popular system, um, I want to show a different system just to give another example. And I'll show one that's a little bit less common, but still it's a system. So here, I'm going to show a system of the English opening here. 
English opening is 1c4. And so here we'll play some of these moves. And this position here is what's called the English opening Botvinnik system. And in this, white's setup is really obvious. They're just attempting to really dominate the center here with their use of pawns and all their pieces. And the fact that's really nice about this opening is the knight is still on g1. This has been delayed intentionally because white does not want to put the knight on f3. Usually they want to relocate the knight to e2 and help prepare pawn from f2 to f4. Where if the pawn was on f3, you know, or if the knight was on f3, it would be blocking this pawn advance because the knight would be in the way. So the purpose of f2 to f4, it does weaken your king slightly, you know, so you do have to be a little careful with that. But it's got a very aggressive idea in mind. And the idea is you're simply deterring black from playing e7, e5, and helping black contest the center. So in some sense, it really does do well with opening principles. You're really fighting well for the center. And if I was to just play a few more common moves here, this is a really typical setup for white in this system. So the focus of any system opening is really more emphasis on what one side plays and not so much with what the opponent plays. In this position, just like the London, white will pretty much go for this up unless black plays some really different you know, concept that really you know, changes what they can play or not. White is pretty much going to play these exact same moves just in different move orders based on what the opponent does. So okay, so that was another system. And so very similar to system, now there's another chess opening term, which is called formation. And so this one here, I'm going to play a, another formation. Um, well, not another, this is the first one. Um, so this formation here is called the hedgehog pawn formation I'm going to bring up. And so this formation here, you know, as with all formations, it's very similar to a system. In this case, it's for black, where right now we're kind of focusing on the black side, not so much for the white. But what's different with formations is it's more focused on pawns. Whereas systems, like the London, you know, it's more about pawns and pieces, kind of where all the pieces go in order. Now, what makes this a hedgehog formation specifically is that in the hedgehog, black will have pawns in a6, b6, d6, and e6. And with this, um, this is, the, I guess, the main part of the formation. And the other part is oftentimes black will have their c pawn, and it'll exchange itself for a white's d pawn. And so that is exactly what we have here. So this is a hedgehog formation. More refers to pawns than all pawns and pieces. Now, what's unique about formations is you will not see this under an opening database. Maybe it'll comment like hedgehog in the name, but it's not going to say hedgehog formation. And the reason for that is if you're playing a system, like say the London system, all of your variations are still within the London system. It's just going to be a different variation of the London system. However, formations are not within the same opening. This exact setup here, with black playing this hedgehog formation, this can actually come up in many different openings. When I play this example here, this was out of an English opening, where white played c4 on move 1. But if I was to show a different opening, like say the Sicilian opening, the con variation, we can actually get the same exact setup for black out of a different opening. And so I'll take a look and I'll show that. So here we start with the Sicilian looks pretty good so far you know looks logical we're playing here and then a6 in this exact move order is the sicilian defense con variation and notice how very similar it is to the english opening we just looked at you know we already have pawns on a6 and e6 and very shortly we could put a pawn on b6 and d6 and get the exact same setup now because of this you know oftentimes the pieces will go in the same locations um one common idea is if these pawns are on these squares Oftentimes, this knight will be rerouted to d7, queen to c7, rook to c8, or, or something of this setup, but the pieces are not really required for this to be a formation. It's primarily with the pawns, whereas systems, it's more about the pawns and the pieces, and everything is just within that very specific opening. So that is the definition of a formation. Now, this formation, in this case I was focusing on black, but you could actually play the exact same setup for white if you just kind of like mirrored it or reversed it. And that actually brings me to the next type of opening which I've noticed, which are reversed or inverted openings. So before I show that, I want to flip the board and show something very briefly for black here. So a very common idea is if against d4, black can play something called a Dutch defense, which is f5, and to get the classical Dutch, we'll have c4 and e6. And so this position here is called the classical Dutch defense 
Dutch defense refers to the opening name, just like how it was Rui Lopez earlier in the video. And classical refers to the very particular variation that we have here within this more general opening. So in this, the Dutch defense, take note of how black's pawns are arranged, and maybe sort of kind of, you know, how white's pawns are arranged in relation to this. Now the reason this is important is because if we were to go back now, and I was to start with 1f4, which is the bird's opening, play d5, e3, c5. So this is the bird's opening, 1f4. But here, this 2e3 is actually the Dutch variation, because if you notice, this is exactly the same position as the Dutch defense. The only difference is, it is now white who's played it, and black spawns over here, and it's the exact same position, but it's mirrored. So now it's from the white perspective. And so all of these inverted or mirrored openings are exactly the same thing you would play with the other side, but you're playing it from the other color. And the big difference here is that with this, you know, white has moved first. And so if you really love the Dutch defense as black, all of your same ideas, you could actually play from the white side, and you have the exact same plans, exact same ideas, you might limit your study because, you know, you can just focus on one thing, learn it well, and then play it from the other side. The problem here, which isn't always a problem, but in this case I think it's a problem, is that white has moved first. And that might sound like a very small detail, because you might think, well, moving first, that's an extra tempo, and an extra tempo sounds like a really good thing. Is that a superior version of the Dutch defense? Uh, not necessarily. And so the reason why this is, is because in the Dutch defense, black will also oftentimes have a lot of value in playing really useful moves, but sort of like a waiting game, where you, you wait for white to play a move, and then you have that extra information, and you can react based on what white is playing. Now, the problem here is, if you're playing this Dutch setup as white, White moves first, and so you don't have the luxury of seeing what your opponent does before you can respond to it. And so that version, you know, might not actually help you as much, because even though you're an extra tempo ahead, you're revealing your intentions, intentions of the opening one tempo earlier. And so that isn't always better. Now, the best example I can think of, and why I chose to show this exact opening for this opening category, is because Dutch defense expert Vladimir Malaniuk was once asked why he didn't try the reverse Dutch with 1f4 birds opening. And, <laughs> kind of funny, Malaniuk responded, that extra move will hurt me. <laughs> because, you know, having you know this move, it looks like it's a good thing that you can move first. But, you know, it completely changes the opening, even though it's just one tempo and everything else is otherwise identical. You know, having to move first or moving second is actually a really big deal that can change a lot with openings. So those are what are called reversed or inverted openings. Now the next category you will also not find in a database, kind of like formations, but I will definitely include it. I call these joke openings. And so with a joke opening, this one in particular is called the bond cloud opening. Joke openings aren't always labeled in databases because you know oftentimes they're just under some miscellaneous or unconventional opening and it's not actually good enough to be I guess, categorized as an actual opening. Now, in this case, this opening was, uh, you know, eventually categorized only because it became so popular. Um, but originally, if you were to go back even a year or two ago, um, this opening would have not been in a database. So now it is listed as an opening. But how I define joke openings is basically it's some kind of opening that usually the opponent just plays for in blitz or bullet just for laughs or some kind of garbage opening, or they're just trying to make a statement, basically saying, hey, I can win with any opening. And that's exactly what we have here. You know, with the Bond Cloud opening, objectively, it's a really bad opening. Now, it was popularized by Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura, with who he did not invent this opening, but in his Bond Cloud speedrun videos, he certainly made it very popular. And before it gained this popularity, you know, this opening was not by opening theory, it was not by name, it was not in an opening database. You know, people had studied it, but if you would put this in a database, it would just say like 1e4 King's Pawn opening. You know, it wouldn't even recognize the Bond Cloud by name. And so all joke openings are just like that. You know, they're not even listed, but I certainly believe that they should be listed in some kind of category. And so I grouped them all together and call these joke openings. Now, the reason this is so bad, just for those who are unaware, is it violates a lot of opening principles because here we've voluntarily given up our castling rights usually want to castle early, and we can't castle if the king has already moved. And also, this move really hinders white's development, because now the f1 bishop is especially unhappy trying to get out, 
And maybe even if the queen wants to get out, the king is also in the way. So that, combined with the fact that the king has voluntarily given up its own castling, castling rights just on move two, makes this a not-so-great opening if your opponent is you know, pretty keen on opening principles or knows what they're doing. So that's this opening. But let me go back and I'll show a different example of a joke opening. So this opening here, um, start with c4, and then I'll play e6. And this next joke opening, um, it starts off looking kind of normal. And this opening is called the Drunken Master opening. And it was invented by National Master Wesley Falco. And in this opening, we play it for the black side, but it can also be played from the white side with an extra tempo. Now, here, black is playing a pretty normal-looking, you know, setup for the first few moves. And that's the whole purpose is to kind of disguise this joke opening. And, but eventually, it's going to become pretty obvious of the silliness and black setup is about to be revealed pretty shortly. So here, we'll play some normal-looking moves. And very quickly, we can see what black's idea is, as silly looking at as it is. And this position here is now the beginning of this drunken master setup this funny little joke opening where the primary idea is black will soon play f6 and they'll play g5 or g6 g5 and then they're just going to swing the rook over to g7 and it looks kind of crazy but this is a really interesting attacking idea it's very aggressive and these rooks are going to help support all these pawns and black is just going to launch a pawn storm against the white king side and it's a very interesting idea it's really good for bullet and such but, you know, that's the thing with joke, joke openings. You know, they're oftentimes really not too sound, kind of like the gambits we were looking at. But they're interesting ideas, and, you know, who knows? It could be something fun to play. It could be, you know, just something as a joke. Hence the term that I call for it, joke opening. So, okay, so now let's get back to kind of a little bit more serious openings, a little more solid again. So let's return back to the, the original thing, the Rui Lopez. And I'll show another concept, which these I call anti-openings. And we'll show why very shortly here. So we'll play all these. These are all book moves. As with the whole video, all this is complete opening theory. And here, a very popular move for white is to play on move 8. They play the move c3. Very logical idea. As with common in the Rui Lopez, they're trying to retreat the bishop later by giving it a square to retreat to. In this case, a c2 square. And they're also preparing pawn to d4. In that case, the c3 pawn is going to help support the d4. And, you know, this looks like a pretty good positional move, and it's going to get some pretty good play in it. Now, maybe a problem, maybe not, but black has a very strong response to this move. And so here, this move is d5. Now, some people might know this. It's a very famous opening. This is the Rui Lopez martial attack. And with this opening, you know, maybe a lot of white players you know, might not want to enter into this because a lot of players on the black side have studied this if that's in their open repertoire, they actually want to enter into this attack. And a lot of players with white just don't want to, you know, get into it. If they can avoid it by any means, and why they have to, you know, deal with this whole mess of this attack and black striking in the center. D5 is a very strong move in response to C3. So let's actually go back a bit, you know, go back one move to before the C3 was played, and I'll show the concept of what I call anti-openings. So here, instead of c3, white can actually try the move a4. And a4 is called the anti-martial variation, because it seeks to avoid black from playing the martial attack, which is d5 in response to c3. So d5 is a very strong option to meet c3, but here, if black were to play d5, that would be a positional blunder. And the reason it's so bad is because now, white can simply capture on a you know, a4, cap a captures b5, and unlike before, you know, now black is in trouble because they can't recapture back because there's this pin on the a file. They don't want to lose their rook. And so the natural, you know, continuation here would be d captures e4, b captures c6, e captures f3, and queen captures f3. And now if you check the material, white just wins the pawn, and they have a sim very simple but slight advantage out of the opening. And so a4 was actually successful in preventing this whole variation of the martial attack with d5. And that's the whole purpose of anti-openings. You know, anti-openings is basically exactly what it sounds. It's like an anti-weapon against a very particular opening. So, for obvious reasons, I call that the anti-opening category. But next, let's get to something a little more common. So, you'll notice in a lot of openings, they have the word attack in the name. And in this case, you know, 
oh, well, really with any attacking case, it's really some aggressive motif that really happens with the last move from white. And here it's a very common opening. This is the well-known King's Indian attack for white. And here's white's a very common setup. So they have the knight on f3. They have this g pawn on g3. They'll often fianchetto their bishop to g2. They'll have the d pawn on d3. They'll have the e pawn on e4. And the b knight on d2. Now, does this setup kind of remind you of a system? Because, you know, here we've only focused on white's side. And if the answer to that is yes, well, correct, it actually is. You know, white can actually play this against pretty much anything black plays. And you might wonder, well, should that be called a system? It is. As funny as it sounds, that is actually called the Barska system, named after Grandmaster Barska, um, who's a Hungarian Grandmaster. And nowadays, you know, if white achieves all of the moves that I had up there with the arrows, then it's usually called that system. However, if they, for whatever reason, cannot get all of those moves in, or most of those moves, then it fails to meet the criterion for that system, and they just call it the generic catch-all category of the King's Indian attack. And so if we were to play a few moves here, where I will show one example where white does not get all of their desired moves in. Here I'll play a few more moves. So this particular line is within the King's Indian attack, and white never got their pawn to the e4 square just like I was mentioning in the other line. So this isn't quite that same system that we're looking at, but it is still the King's Indian attack, because we still have the knight here on f3, we still have this fianchetto structure, this pawn in g3. Now, it wasn't until, in this exact thing, uh, it wasn't actually until move 31, where finally black played e4, and then a white pawn landed on the e4 square, but not in the traditional way. It wasn't e2 to e4, it was actually d captures e4, and it was only then, on move 32, that white finally got a pawn on e4, but that doesn't actually qualify for the system, because now the d-pawn has moved from d3. So this opening stayed as a king's Indian attack, and the game that we're following here, if you want to look it up afterwards, this whole opening line, this was the game Reti Rubinstein from Carlsbad 1923, and Reti won a very notable game with this, with the white pieces. Now, in the actual game, white didn't castle here until move 17. But let me just castle here just to show a setup, just so I can show a very um, important configuration here. So, what I want to highlight here is, although castling will be worse than the actual game, I just want to kind of ignore the rest of the chessboard for a little bit. And I want to highlight the this whole structure that white has on the castled king side. So, we notice that white has a castled king, all right? They have this fianchetto bishop on the long diagonal, and they have this knight, which is just blocking the bishop, just kind of in the bishop's scope here. And then we have this little hat structure with the pawns, um, this fianchetto idea, where the pawn is on f2, g3, and h2. Now, kind of keep it like a little mental note of this fianchetto structure, because this is the king's Indian attack, and I want to compare that structure a little bit later to the King's Indian defense. Now, before we get that, I just want to make one other comment about this concept of attack in the opening name. So even though this is called a King's Indian attack, I want to comment that just because it has attack in the name, it does not mean that every attack has some kind of mirrored thing for the other side that is called a defense. So here, what's actually the reason it's named an attack in the name is because white was the one to move last and kind of note the opening in what it was called. And so what I mean by that is when this opening was the King's Indian attack, it was knight f3, and when they played, it was what, d5, and then we had pawn to g3. And when they play pawn g3, the name King's Indian attack is what comes up. But g3 was the move that white played. And so because white moved last, and the opening was then named, it becomes an attack in the name hence King's Indian attack. Now, if it was black to move last, then it would become a defense, which we'll see later will be the King's Indian defense. Now, I want to show one other small example in a slightly different way of some other opening that has attack in the name. So here I'm going to bring us back to the Italian game, which we were here a little bit earlier. We're going to get a slightly different variation in it, though. Here we have knight f6, going a little further into this line. Now, white has many good options here. They can play pawn to d3 is fine. They can play pawn to d4 is fine. They can play knight c3 is fine. There's a lot of good moves that white can play here. 
And all of these moves I've shown are in alignment with chess opening principles, they're fighting for the center, or they're facilitating peace development. However, an attack isn't always justified. You know, sometimes it's unsound, sometimes it is sound. Um, but a lot of times it's prematurely launching some kind of aggressive attack. Not always, but in a lot of cases it is. It's certainly, I would argue, the case here. And I consider this move dubious, even though you know it's okay by a lot of players' standards. Um, but I'm going to mark this as inaccurate here. Um, this is called the Italian game knight attack. And it's quite clear that this is the attacking knight. And we're certainly coordinating with the c4 bishop. And we're simply attacking, putting a lot of pressure on the f7 square. Now, the reason that this is called an attack is because the move that defined this, as I was mentioning earlier with the king's Indian, the last move that was played was knight g5. And knight g5 is a move for white, and so this is an attack. Now, if it was a similar opening, but black was the last one to move, then it would be some kind of opening with defense in the name. Now, it is my bold claim here that this knight attack is actually unsound, and this is up for debate. You know, a lot of players debate this or not. The reason I believe this is because, in my opinion, I think the Polario defense for black actually refutes this. And back when I used to play e4, e5 as my main repertoire for the black pieces, I used to play this opening for a few years, and I used to have a lot of deep lines of opening theory memorized with this. In a lot of my games, I would commonly get games that were 10 to 20 moves of memorized opening theory. And in all these sharp games, you know, I got pretty good, interesting results with it. But I've seen some games in databases where this knight attack has been analyzed well past move 30. And it is my belief that black refutes this entire setup from white. And I think white should have been better to stick with opening principles than move the knight again so early. But nevertheless, in all the complications I've seen over the years and through the databases, you know, it's quite clear that there is a myriad of places that, you know, black and white could go wrong. And so if you want to study this and get into some really interesting complications, you know, this could be a good opening to try even if it might not be sound. Now, I will say that in the Polario defense that I played, you know, black will oftentimes sacrifice one or two pawns, sometimes even more material, and they'll get actually a long-term attack on white's king. But so you have to play very actively, and sometimes the compensation isn't always so clear. So it's very tricky. You definitely have to study. But, you know, the whole purpose of this opening is just to, you know, kind of show, you know, what's an attack and what's a defense. And this is certainly an attack because white was the last one to move. And that's why it, some kind of name has attack in the name. In this case, Italian game, knight attack. But okay, let's not go in circles too much. Let's go back to the King's Indian defense, as I promised earlier. Earlier, we looked at the King's Indian attack, which was for white. And now just to kind of show this concept further. So we will get to the King's Indian defense here. Um, Bishop g7, e4, d6, knight f3, castles. And this is the main line, um, normal variation, of the King's Indian defense. Now, you'll notice that black was the last one to make a move. In this case, black is just castled. And because the name now comes up here, and black was last move, this is called a defense. Now, remember I said to keep in mind that Fianchetto configuration we had earlier in the King's Indian attack. Notice here that black is castled on the king's side, just like before. We have a Fianchetto bishop contesting the long diagonal, just like we had earlier. We also have a knight blocking in just the same way, you know, blocking bishop's scope over this diagonal. And then we also have this little pawn hat configuration where we have pawns in f7, or yeah, f7, g6, and h7. And this is the exact same Fianchetto setup that was with the King's Indian attack. But now, because it was black to move last, in this case when they castled, it is called defense in the name, hence King's Indian defense. Okay, so quite a bit here. Now, to show a much simpler example of a defense, maybe not so simple in theory, but simple in how few moves it is, here we only have one move for each side, e4 and e6, and this is called the French defense. Now, when we play d4 and d5, this will be the normal variation, but you'll notice that even after move one here, white has moved and black has moved, and now this is categorized as the French, and because black moved last, it is the French defense. Now when we play d4 and then d5, again, black was the last to move, so this is the French defense normal variation. But defense is in the name, because when this opening was named, black was the last one to move and kind of denote this is the actual opening, and so that's why it's classified as a defense. Okay, so now the next thing, the next category that we have for openings is sometimes openings were named based on the places that they were popularized. 
So back long, long time ago, the chess, you know, didn't really exist. And we had a very similar game called Chaturanga, which originated in India. And that game eventually spread to Europe and spread eventually to the rest of the world. And this game is the origin, this ancestor game of what has become chess. And as chess was developing back in the early days, you know, you had people from all over the world playing. And oftentimes what would happen is you would have players playing from all these different countries and parts of the world. And certain groups, for whatever reason, they would start to play certain openings in certain places. And so this opening here is black we're looking at was the French defense. Well, it's no surprise that this would prob probably be popular as a defense to play in France. For whatever reason, they had started playing this opening. And so if we were to look at other openings, some other openings are also named after places. And so to give a good example of an opening that's named after a place, I could play here, this with G3 and this exact thing. This is called the Catalan opening. Now, this is actually named after Catalonia. And, you know, that would be the place that this opening is popularized in. But it's not only places. You know, there were other reasons why openings would be named for different things. You know, a good thing here is some openings are named after players. In this case, the players who popularized it. Here, on move one, we have e4, knight f6. Well, this is called Alekin's defense. And this was named after chess world champion Grandmaster Alekin, who popularized this opening for black. Now, again, we can take note of the fact that black has moved last. And that's why this opening is called Defense in the name. And again, it's Alekin's Defense, so it's named after a player. So there's kind of an overlap here. We have an opening named after a player, and it has Defense in the name. And you'll notice that with a lot of these opening names, they have a lot of overlap in how these are categorized. Now, another opening that is named after a player, which is kind of an interesting example here, is E4C6. Well, it's actually named after two players. So... The players who this is named after, the Karo Khan defense, is English player Horatio Karo and Austrian player Marcus Khan, who both analyzed this opening in the year 1886, and the hyphenated opening name comes from both of their last names, hence the chess opening name Karo Khan. So some openings are named after the players who popularized it. Now another category, there's quite a bit here, and so the next category is what I call descriptive. And so if we were to return to the Italian game, bring that up once again, um, but we're going to play it slightly differently here. We'll still start with this move order, but we'll talk about d3, which I mentioned earlier was one of White's ideas. Well, here we could play bishop c5 and transpose back to the Gioco piano game. And this particular variation within that opening is called the Gioco pianissimo variation. And these are good examples of what's called a descriptive opening. Now, what I mean by descriptive is... Gioco Piano is Italian for quiet game, and Gioco Pianissimo is Italian for very quiet game. And that refers to the quiet developing moves that this opening usually entails. In this opening, there's usually very little tactical spark, and a lot of players just play really solid developing moves for a while and make small little positional nuances in games. So in this case, the name refers to the style that this opening ends up playing. Now, descriptive can also mean describing the opening in a few other ways. Here, a really good example that's very common is here we have, I'll put up this, what's known as the Sicilian dragon. Most people know that variation. And so the dragon is very popular. Sometimes it's called a Sicilian Draco, but it's the same thing. So the Sicilian Draco variation or Sicilian dragon variation is another descriptive opening. And the reason it's called this is because the black pawn structure with the pawns on d6, e7, f7, g7, and or g6 and h7, here, these highlighted pawns, it kind of sort of resembles the star points on the Draco constellation. And so that is where this opening gets the name Dragon Variation. So it's, again, it's another description that helps describe this opening, hence why I call it a descriptive opening. Now, the very last one isn't quite an opening in the same way, um, but I want to explain the term called transposition, which is another very common term you're going to find in a lot of these chess openings. And so I'll just show a small opening, which is a good example to illustrate the concept. Here we have the very popular Queen's Gambit opening. We have d4, d5, and then white will play c4. And this is by far the most common way to reach this position. But take note of this exact position where the pawns are and whose side to move it is. Now, if we were to go back, we could start with c4. And it's probably not a good idea for black to play d5 here, because white is probably just going to take this. But for whatever reason... 
if white didn't want to take that pawn and they really want to transpose back to the queen's gambit, they could play the move d4. And here, they've transposed back to this opening. So notice this position is identical to the one we were just looking at. So transposing just means you're playing the same exact opening, but you're reaching it through a different move order. And sometimes it's beneficial to do that for you know tricking your opponent into playing something they didn't want to play, or maybe it's just for repertoire reasons you want to avoid other lines by transposing. So transpositions is something you have to be careful with, because in this case, you know, you've reached the same exact position, but in a slightly different move order. And here it's the same thing, but you know, maybe somewhere along the line in a deeper opening, maybe you'll actually enter some different variation that you didn't actually want to enter into. So that was my summary of all of these categories. Again, there's over a thousand different variations in chess. There's a lot. And so to categorize all of these, I've noticed these are kind of some of the patterns that I've noticed in opening names. And so I hope this was illustrative for a lot of people. Maybe they could use this as some kind of reference material. And take note, these are more or less why these certain attributes of names come up in within certain openings. So just to review real quickly, we had opening was defined. We had line and variation. We had game, which was in included in the openings. We had gambit. We had talked a little bit about soundness, what makes the gambit sound or not, accepted or declined based on if they took the material. We had counter gambit, when some side takes the, doesn't take the gambit and creates basically a gambit of their own. We looked at system, those types of openings. We looked at formations, which could come up for many different types of openings, but more about the pawn structure. We looked at reverse or inverted openings. We took a look at joke openings. We looked at anti-openings. We've looked at openings with attack in the name. We've looked at openings with defense in the name. We've also taken a look at openings with that were popularized based on the place that they were first played in. We looked at openings named after players who popularized the opening. We've looked at openings with descriptive features. And then we finally, we even talked about transposition. So there was quite a bit there. If anyone has noticed any other variations that have some kind of common names that I might have missed, you can mention them in the YouTube comments. Maybe we can, you know, add a little list going and see if there's other patterns that come up. But out of all the openings that I looked at, and I've looked at through the ECO code for quite a while and tried to get through the whole thing and see if there were other patterns that I missed. But these were all of them that I'd noticed. And so I think condensing it down this concisely from over a thousand down to just these few categories is actually going to be kind of helpful in actually naming and identifying these correctly. So I hope everyone found this entertaining or instructional at the very least. And so as interesting it was, I hope to see you all next time and good luck with your chest and I'll see you in the future.